welcome to the third session of Talking About Teaching. We're uh, very excited today uh, to have Srikant Datar, professor uh, from Harvard Business School, joining us today. And uh, the topic of design thinking is one that, as you will learn, I would say is relatively recently come to uh, after a career from Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon to Stanford to Harvard, really specializing in accounting as in the accounting and management unit as taught in the first year of the MBA, uh, required financial reporting control courses, electives, exec ed, and more recently has come to design thinking. So I'd like to just uh, welcome Srikant, and uh, he will be taking on us, I hope, uh, an exciting journey. So thank you, Srikant. Thank you very much, uh, Willis. And great pleasure and uh, honor, really, to be here today and to talk about uh, uh, this course. As Willis said, my background is more mathematics, accounting, finance, and so uh, this topic is, of course, quite uh, new to me as well. So I thought I should just give you a two-minute introduction on how I came to uh, this particular topic, why I felt it was an important topic for us to explore, and why I uh, ended up designing this course a uh, couple of uh, years ago. So 2012 was its first offering. So 2008, HBS celebrated its uh, centennial, and a very dear friend of mine, David Garvin, who is, uh, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do, uh, who is uh, the, the second name on the, on the uh, book there, uh, asked if he and I could uh, work together to basically, it's 100 years, let's at least review what's happened in management education, and a little bit more or less look at what's happening in business education at Harvard. And that was basically when David came to me suggesting that we work on this topic. That was the idea. We started our work in about 2006. And the last really serious work on evaluating management education was done in the two famous reports in 1959. Both came out in 1959, Carnegie Corporation and the Ford Foundation reports on management education that put management education much more towards the social sciences approach of doing research, uh, really changed the trajectory of research that got done in business schools uh, from that point onwards. But no real review of management education had been done till after that. And you know, it's not a topic that somebody wants to uh, do much uh, work on uh, anyway, but this was 100 years, and so we thought we should do it. We had a very simple objective. Just look at Harvard Business School and see what uh, we would find and see where are we doing well, where can we improve. I think the only good decision we made very early on was that we weren't going to look at ourselves in making that choice. We were going to look at a number of other schools. And 2006, the world couldn't have looked better. Absolutely fantastic in terms of China embracing market economics, India embracing market economics, demand for business schools likely to go through the roof. So this was, I mean, looked perfect almost. And but we said, let's look at it. We'll reaffirm everything we're doing is fine, not a problem. It looks, uh, <laughs> it looks like it's uh, you know exactly the way it should be. Of course, 2008 comes around, and now uh, the world looks completely different from the world we had started looking at in 2006. It's interesting. We were saying roughly the same things in 2006 as we were saying in. 2008, 2006, no one was really listening to us because you know everything looked fantastic. And 2008, they're saying, wow, really? You're looking at this topic? It seems like it's an important one for us to look at. Uh, there were three basic uh, uh, findings in, uh, uh, in, in, re in rethinking the MBA. I'll just very quickly go over it just to give you a flavor of how this course is positioned and then dive into the course. Uh, we took borrowed from a lot of work that had been done before in terms of professional education saying that there are three important parts of professional education that you have to think about a profession always has a body of knowledge so we call that knowing and of course we did a we thought business schools had done a good job of that and research had kind of moved forward but then there were two other parts which is unlike medical schools where after you go to medical school you actually practice and you do residency before you're allowed to you know, operate on someone or treat anybody. You know, we don't have that in business school. So we began to identify that as the knowing doing gap. And we were beginning to see this in quite some significant measure as our research was proceeding. And then the last part, which is that unlike other professions, business is a profession where 
you work with other people and uh, you're only as good as the people around you. And so what impact do you have on others? How do you inspire them? How do you motivate them? And were we doing a good enough job of thinking about that? And so that became what we called being. So there were these three elements of it, focusing a little bit on this knowing, doing uh, gap. And if I was, to, there were a lot of unmet uh, needs that we wa wanted to, that we identified, but if I was to sort of summarize very quickly how this particular topic that I'm going to talk to you about today came about. If my left hand is no information about a particular problem, and my right hand is full information about a particular problem, so I'm, let's say, trying to decide whether I should open a manufacturing plant. Here, right hand is everything I possibly might want to know to do it. That's as much information as I have. Left, I don't know quite how the workers might be. I don't quite know how the, uh, how the laws might be. I don't quite know how the regulations and that uh, might change. There are lots of things that I don't know. And there might be strategic decisions. There might be marketing decisions. Doesn't matter what it is. The left hand is no information. Right hand is everything I would love to know to decide. And much of management research, of course, was moving the left hand towards the right. So we developed five forces of strategy that Mike Porter, one of our coll my colleagues at the business school, did. And then, of course, uh, capital asset pricing model in terms of trying to figure out how securities are priced, very major uh, development in finance. So left hand moving towards the right. Of course, the right hand was moving out as the <laughs> left hand was coming uh, closer. And as all of us know, in our particular profession, we take a lot of care in doing our research and it takes a long time, but you know, we can't move as quickly as the world is moving. And so there's, and so what David and I basically hypothesized in uh, rethinking the MBA is what if we sort of change the dialogue in how we think about management education rather than only moving the left towards the right, which by the way, we always say is a good idea. We should keep doing that. Don't, let's not stop doing it. But is it possible to actually train individuals to be prepared to operate in the gap? Because at the end of the day, that's where they're going to find themselves. There's going to be differences in context, contingencies, complexity. They're going to be in the gap. And we do very little to train them how to be in the gap. And so that's what got us thinking about thinking innovatively and creatively, where we actually don't have an answer to something and we're going to be in the gap. How do we? end up uh, uh, training people to think in the gap, and that's what this particular course is about. I'll uh, point out that uh, this course is, as I was discussing with Judy a little bit earlier on, very different from everything else we do at the business school. So this is not a case-based course. That's why we have organized this room in a different, uh, a completely different way. It takes the viewpoint that you can only learn this kind of material. How do you think innovatively and creatively by diving in, by doing it, by practicing it repeatedly, much like we wouldn't teach our kids uh, swimming by giving them a long lecture on swimming and then making sure they get an A before you drop them into the deep end of the <laughs> pool. You wouldn't teach them swimming by the case method. You wouldn't say, Willis, how do you swim? Todd, how do you swim? And we wouldn't do it. You know, we don't do it. We teach swimming in a particular way. You put them in the pool, they kick around, they make mistakes, they practice some more, they correct it. That's how they get to be proficient uh, swimmers. So, and one can do piano. I mean, you can imagine teaching. And not that there isn't some technique that you can talk, but you can't just focus on one aspect of that pedagogy. And so we began questioning whether the pedagogy that business schools are using are the right kinds of pedagogies. And should we be fundamentally rethinking those pedagogies? It did lead to what Harvard Business School then started doing, which was the field method. But we can talk more about that in your questions. I'll focus at this point in the course. So it's learning by doing. It's only by doing will you actually learn. So it's not just take the knowledge and apply it. You actually got to do it to learn. And so much of it is in the form of exercises. I'll give you a little exposure to it uh, as we do the session today. One of the early decisions uh, we made when we were designing this course is that we were going to open the course up to other parts of the university. So this was not going to be only a Harvard Business School course. So from the very first rendition of this course to today, I have students from all these different parts of Harvard that are represented in in the classroom. So medical school, public health, Kennedy school, education school, uh, SEAS, design school, MIT, Tufts, all these schools are represented uh, in our class. We have 150 students, so about 90 of them come from the business school, 60 of them come from outside the business school. 
and it was always in the design. I've luckily, huge demand for the course from both inside Harvard, inside the business school and outside, but I've still resisted the temptation of only doing business school students. I, I probably will continue to always resist that and always try and encourage students from other parts of the university to come in. So diversity crucial if you're trying to teach people how to think innovatively. And of course, the biggest question that I was asked when I was working on this course is, is it at all possible to get people to think innovatively and creatively? Or is it just a gift from God? If God happened to give you that particular gene, you're very innovative. If he forgot, <laughs> you're out of luck. And I've always not, I've never liked that way of thinking on almost any dimension. And so that's not to say there's not going to be a distribution of talent. We all you know, learn uh, to, uh, to write uh, you know, uh, good English, but not everyone becomes a great poet or a great writer. And we all learn mathematics, not everyone. So there's going to be differences in talent, as there will be here. But to think that it can't be taught, I think, and I'll actually make a point a little bit later on. I'll even go so far as to say I don't know if I actually teach the students uh, uh, in this course how to think innovatively and creatively, but I do hope that I help them to learn. So they can learn it. You can give them a few techniques and props to help them. And I, I'm, all the exercises I, I'll give you, I'll tell you ahead of time that I could not do any one of them that you will actually be trying. So anyone who actually gets past some of these exercises, you know, fantastic. But don't be surprised if you don't, because I'll come to telling you from just studies of the brain why it is that we can't actually do it. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm just. Willis and uh, Judy and others wanted me to focus on pedagogy, so I'll, but I just thought I'll give you what the arc of the course is to place what it is that you will do and why we'll do a few of the exercises that I'll put you to. Uh, usually when we think about a problem solving approach, you say, give me a problem, I'll come up with a solution. When you're in this gap, when you're not in a body of knowledge that's already known, when you're trying to expand, trying to think about something different, of course, there is no obvious solution to the problem that is being posed. By definition, that's what we're trying to think about. So you've got to go through a different arc. And I won't go through all the steps here, but I will ex give you glimpses of what I do to try and help students understand each of these steps. But those are the steps that are done. The, perhaps the first most important is how do you develop a deep understanding and empathy when you observe? Most of us are fixed in the way in which we look at things. So I look at it the way you know, I look at it. It's hard for me to even begin to imagine how Terry might look at it, or Todd might look at it, or Willis might look at it, because I, it's, it's not what is, what is natural. We give them a number of exercises. We won't do that here to help them do that. What does it mean to get insights from those observations? And there are several techniques that we do that helps people go from observations to insights. Once they've got insights, uh, how do you often have to reframe problems? So it's not just you got a uh, the problem, now let's go solve it. You got to reframe it. You, you got to really spend time trying to understand the problem. I will put you through one exercise to show you why problem framing is a very, very important uh, technique. Uh, that I helps identify opportunity areas. Then there are amazingly, and you'll see a couple, a number of techniques for actually help us to ideate. Many of the things we were talking about, uh, uh, Dr. Judy, before we started, actually if I apply some of these techniques, those are clear solutions that would emerge from uh, what these techniques are. So I'll talk about techniques that you can use. It's a very technique heavy course, I guess a little bit of my background in finance, mathematics, and accounting. So, you know, heavy on techniques. How do you develop concepts and uh, prototype things? Uh, this concept development's an important part because it reduces substantially the risks of innovation. We think of innovation as very risky, but if you're able to prototype, if you're able to experiment, if you're able to try something before you actually have to dive in completely, you can substantially reduce the risks. And we go through a number of sessions on what's called rapid prototyping and how do you actually prototype many, many different things that uh, you can. And as any of you, as we get into later discussions about how you might apply it, it's an interesting thing to think about. How might you prototype some of what we are talking about today that might then reduce the risk of actually implementing a new pedagogy in our classroom? And then you come up to a solution. You'll see we move from concrete to abstract to back to concrete, and that's very much what happens when you're trying to do the innovation process. 
Enough about the course and what led to it. Let me talk about pedagogy that we use. And Caitlin, let's get everyone. Uh, so one of the important things we do is what we call problem framing. How do you frame problems? And how you frame a problem will often dictate whether you can come up with a solution or not. So we do this little rope exercise that I'm going to put you through. I'm going to give each of you a rope. So this is just to give you a flavor for how the pedagogy in the class works. Uh, and what I'd request you to do is to find a partner. So you need, and if someone's, uh, if there's an extra person, we'll find somebody else uh, there. There'll be people. So everyone have a rope. And then if you can get up from your seats, we don't let people sit down in our seats for very long. Uh, we make them get up. And uh, so a partner. Anyone not have a partner? Everyone have? Because we need one for Terry. Everyone, everyone have a partner other than Terry? No, 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 no. We're going to get either Caitlin or, 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 or. So everyone have a partner? OK. Now here's what I'm going to do. So I'll just give instructions very, very quickly. So what you do, one of, one of you ties the rope on the wrist of your partner. Now, only one, it should be a very small circle right around the wrist of the partner. But don't tie it so tight that I'm squeezing circulation, because uh, <laughs> I'm not a doctor. So that would be a problem. So just tie it, just tie it on, on one. And keep a long, make sure that you've got a lot of rope hanging down. That not the, you should keep, the, keep a lot of rope available. <laughs> All right. Now, the partner does this to the other person as well. So you'll see that it ends up, uh, it doesn't matter which wrist, you'll soon, you'll soon see that the wrist doesn't really matter. Caitlin, you might just want to help people as they're doing it, and I'll do it as well. So just a second rope, yeah. Terrific, terrific, all got it, all right. Everyone have it down, all right, excellent. OK. All right, now the next step, and I'm just going to try and move it uh, along. The partner loops it around and ties it on the other wrist. So you're basically going to take this wrist, uh, this part of the rope, uh, Todd, and tie it around Willis's okay. wrist here. Okay. Around, the other around the other wrist. So there's one of you who has got a loop, and the other one's got it dangling. One has got a loop, and the other one's got it dangling. So what we're going to do now is you're going to now feed the rope exactly right through the loop. So so what I'm going to do, uh, Todd, is just yeah. feed it through here. Right. And now Willis would have tied it here, but I'm acting as Willis. Right. OK, and please don't start any of the exercise. I'll give you instructions in a second. I hope you like whatever you're cooking for dinner at home. <laughs> <laughs> OK, everyone hooked up? OK, excellent. All right, now let me give you the instructions if you're already hooked up on the, on the screen. So the objective is to get yourself unhooked from your partner, as everyone said, unless you're willing to go with them for dinner tonight and they're <laughs> cooking a good meal, you may not want to do it. Now let's be sure, your own ropes, one sec, let me just complete the instructions. Your own ropes on your own wrists when completed. You cannot have the ropes leave your wrist. You cannot cut, burn, chew, wear down, slice, dice, or dynamite the ropes. You cannot untie any of the ropes. And you cannot take the ropes of your wrists, or your partner's wrists, or anyone else's wrists. They must stay on your wrist throughout. Everyone clear? OK, go. It is. All right, so I've got my first question here. Is it possible? And the answer is it's absolutely possible. Absolutely possible. It's not a trick. No? Anyone want a hint? Anyone want 
a hint. Okay. How many, remember it's all on problem framing. How many circles do you see? Two. Anyone see any other number of circles? How many circles do you see? Three. Three. How do you see three? Oh, you. <laughs> you have created a third circle that was from your gymnastics that was just uh, that you were just doing. Okay, but other, just just as when I first put you into the position, how many circles do you see? Two. Think again. Four around your wrist. See, framing a problem is crucial. If you don't frame it that there are four more circles around the wrist, you'll see only two circles. But in fact, there are six. So far, all of you have worked on two circles because that's what you saw. You didn't think this was a circle because it was just around the wrist and not observed. Many times when we see a problem, we see the problem, the biggest part of the problem is all you see. Now think about using some of the other four circles in order to get out. <laughs> no, not to take it out of your wrist. But I not... didn't take it off. I slid it onto the other wrist. No, 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 not off anything. Right. It should okay. come. It should come. You're the boss. No, 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 Terry. What do I know? You can, but you don't need to. You don't need to. The solution it won't help you to come up with the solution. All right. All right. I mean. Uh, uh, let me give you one more hint because uh, usually in my class, of course, it would go on longer, but I'm just conscious of time. Let me give you one more hint. Why can't it come out from here? Why can't the, so why can't the rope come out from here? Because my arm is attached to my body. Not possible from here. Why can't it come out from here? Because my forearm is attached to my upper arm, right? Can't come out from here. What is the only part of the body that has nothing attached to it? It's my fingers. So think six circles, reframe the problem to six circles, reframe it to say that it's got to come out of your fingers. It cannot come any other way. You cannot take it off the wrist. Yeah. See, you have almost had it. You have almost had it. So you just sneak it through here, very simply. Over his... So he almost had it. He just tapped. He just, he just did it. That's it. Willis, you got it, right? You're practicing again? Okay, so I'll just show it to you. <laughs> I would not get out of this if you gave me the whole day. So don't even. Okay, so all we're going to do is remember six circles. I'm going to take it through this. Feed it through this one around Willis's hand, and now you're ready. All right, folks, let's sit down. Okay, so what we do in our debrief typically, and I'll just move uh, further along because I want to put you through a couple more exercises. Uh, as I said, I don't think I had any chance of getting out of this uh, exercise. You could have given me the whole day, no chance. See, with the hints, maybe, yes. We filmed people doing this and just to show how fixed our brains are because the whole theory of the course is that there's a lot of fixedness in the way in which we think. I actually think the more educated you are, the more fixed you get because you have even more, uh, more uh, you know, uh, and it's called expertise, right? I mean, when you have a lot of knowledge about something, it's called expertise, but that causes a lot of fixedness. And so how do you uh, uh, break that fixedness? We film uh, people doing this exercise and what happens is amazing. So, of course, people don't see the other circles. If you don't see the other circles, you're solving this problem. This is why several of you were telling me it's not possible because you're solving this problem. Because these other circles are not even in your consciousness at that point. Very often, the biggest thing that's there, you see. Everything else, little around you, you miss. And so, this problem can't be solved. The most interesting thing is even after we give them the hint that it can come out from here and over the finger, people will still be doing all the gymnastics <laughs> that you were doing before. Still focused on that. That's how badly it's not. These are extraordinarily smart individuals like you and uh, we'll still be doing that. That's because our brain is still, even though we've given you all those hints, it's not going in. It's still saying, let's keep working on those two circles somehow if I now twist after the hint, I'll get out. Of course, you won't because you're trying to solve this problem and you can't solve it, right? So 
Uh, we go through a lot of debrief on why that happens. Now, what we try to do after this is, uh, uh, is try and break fixedness, try and begin to do it. Again, put uh, students through a number of exercises. This is a very interesting one. The actual company that was actually trying to do this. So this is an electric heating element used to boil water to, be, to make tea, let's say. You've got a cup full of water in that uh, kettle. And the market research suggests that you want to boil the water faster, taking too long. The current best thing on the market is one and a half minutes or whatever to boil a cup of water. You want to do it in 45 seconds. Yeah, really make some real, break, more, uh, make it much faster than what it was. And the question is, how, how would you go about uh, uh, doing that to make this water boil faster? Quick thoughts on how would you make the water boil faster? What would, what would be things that would come to mind if you were trying to innovate, there's no solution to it, you're trying to come up with a solution to boil water faster, what would you do? Increase the current. Increase the current. First thing you'd say is increase the current. Just see if I can get the current out. Yeah, I was thinking increase the surface area. Increase the surface area because you don't want to use convection to get the water. You know, you might you know, do it in such a way that you can increase the surface area. Keep the lid closed. Keep the lid closed. You might think of pressure and, you know, see how that might uh, work. Now. What is interesting, of course, again, everything to do with problem framing, right? We're just trying to put them into exercises of problem. How do you frame the problem matters. Once I tell you what would you do to make the water boil faster, that way of asking the question causes your brain to immediately go to ways of trying to get more heat in. However you get it and you're trying to get more heat in because I framed the question, how will I make the water boil faster? Boil, heat, so get the water in. What happens when water boils? And you can actually see it there, there are bubbles that form and go right around the coil, correct? When bubbles go around the coil, what happens? What happens to the, what the bubbles are made out of what? Air. air. What happens when air is around the coil and you're trying to get heat from the coil into the water? Insulates. Insulates. So bubbles are just a form of insulation. So the company that was trying to work on this problem said the problem is not how to get more heat in, but how do I get the bubbles quickly out? If the bubbles are not going onto the coil, then I can obviously heat the water much faster. Now if you think that is the problem, now you think of completely different solutions than the solution of getting more heat in. Everyone with me? Just the way in which you frame problems matters as to how you go about addressing them. I do this very, case very quickly. I won't even go into a lot of detail about it, just to give you a flavor of uh, problem framing and techniques to break uh, ways in which we typically think. Storm is about to come. This is Napa, uh, Fremark Abbey is a, is a winery in Napa Valley. Uh, with high probability, the storm will harm the grapes. With some probability, the storm will cause the grapes to get a mold called botrytis that will make the grape yield an expensive and beautiful wine. Uh, if you pick the grapes before the storm comes, you're picking it a little early. If you're picking it a little early, you won't get as good a grape as you might have otherwise gotten, but at least you won't get the bad grapes, you know, if the storm comes and destroys the grapes. And what I ask the students to think about is, what alternatives would you explore if you were given this problem, and how would you go about thinking about this problem? Anyone with a, just a very quick sense, the wine you want to make, might get completely destroyed, might get a good wine, you know the probabilities with which the storm will come and probabilities with which all this tends. Split the difference. Split the difference. So <clears throat> take some, you know, uh, pick some of the grapes so that you don't subject everything to risk and the others you might uh, uh, pick. And you might say, you know, I want to, how much do I want to do it? It'll depend on financial risk. It'll depend on how much brand I want, you know, all sorts of things you can calculate. We, of course, have this case in our system, but it is used to do this kind of an analysis. So it's uh, what are called decision trees, and we teach this a lot to our students. How do you make decisions? You know, you figure out probabilities, you figure out uh, where the branches are going, and how would you do eh, Of course, all important, so you should do this. But if you're thinking innovatively, so that's the decision mindset. That is knowledge that you already have, you're applying. Remember, we are trying to think about in the gap. What is in the gap here? What is the most interesting question if you are confronted with the problem? Not as the problem is framed. As the problem is framed, of course, do you pick the grapes? Not pick the grapes. So you pick it, not pick it, half it, whatever, you know, that's fine. That's a completely correct answer to the problem asked in that way. But if you're reframing the problem, if you're trying to get into the habit of reframing, these three techniques are quite useful. We 
and many of these design firms like IDEO and Design Continuum always ask this question, how might we blank? In what ways might we blank? How to blank? What's the most interesting thing in the problem that I pose? Not whether you're going to pick it or not pick it, but is the, as you looked at the entire problem, what's the most interesting facet of that problem? I mean, it's, it's the virus. It's the virus, it's the, it's the bacteria, it's getting botrytis. Yeah. So if you were faced with the problem, the most interesting way to frame that problem is not whether to pick it or not. That's of course one thing that you have to do. But the most interesting way to pick it is how might we, what, Chase? Will cause the virus. Get botrytis more often. That's the most interesting question to ask, not whether to pick it or not. Of course you've got to decide whether to pick it or not, but you can't only frame it that way. It's a very narrow framing of the problem. So there are techniques, how might you accentuate the positives and minimize the negatives that you can apply. And there's a technique that we call webbing that once you've reframed the problem or begun to think using how might we questions, how could you get botrytis more often? And the webbing technique is a very simple technique. It says, why do I want botrytis more often? More money, more reputation, you know, more profits, more, uh, 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 you know, brand, whatever, easy. What's stopping us, Chase? What's stopping you from getting botrytis more often? Storms. Storm, I mean, God, right? God is stopping me because he is not necessarily giving me the kind of storm that would make me get botrytis, right? So that's God stopping me. My land is unfavorable and, uh, uh, you know, it's too risky because now once you ask that question, Chase, you might begin to think, can I do it artificially? Why should I have to wait only for, but now you've reframed the problem. Now you can go wherever. Maybe artificially is also another solution that you could potentially use in this problem and say, well, maybe I can get botrytis. Why should I only rely on the storm? These guys actually ask that question. It turns out that the way uh, those of you familiar with Napa Valley, as you're going north to south, of course, the temperature changes and the intensity of the storm changes. So there is land in Napa Valley that gets botrytis much more regularly. Turns out botrytis is most valuable if you're producing the Riesling grape, the Johannesburg Riesling. If you're not producing that grape, it turns out not to have as much of a value. These guys find land where botrytis comes very regularly, buy that land, the other winery is not making the Riesling grape, so they don't have much of an interest in holding on to that piece of land and have produced botrytis laden grapes on a much more regular basis thereafter. Simply because they reframed the problem at the time a potential different problem arose, and of course if you do that, you have plenty more opportunity to think innovatively and creatively than if you didn't. Okay. Let's go to breaking fixedness. This is the whole thesis of the course. How do you actually go about doing it? And I'm going to, again, very similar to what we just did, I'm going to tell you some why the problem arises and then some techniques to break it, much like we did in problem framing. I call it the flat tire problem. So you can see you're in the middle of a desolate highway, as you will see in the rest of this problem, and you have a flat tire. So you take out your jack, you place the jack under the car. You take out your cross wrench. You remember these wrenches that look like this, where you're going to take out the bolts and start unscrewing the bolts. As you do so, you unscrew three of the bolts, but the fourth bolt is badly rusted, and you cannot turn it to unscrew it. Everyone following? You can't, it, horribly badly rusted. Once again, it's like the ropes problem. You've now got a problem, and you've got to figure out what would you do? How would you go about solving this particular problem. So I always tell my students, for a guy like me who is not very innovative, I take out my phone, <laughs> call up AAA, <laughs> say, please come and help me, because I don't know how to take off this tire, and nor am I, don't have any other idea. So I'll take five, six hours. By the time they come, I might miss the wedding I'm supposed to go to, but at least I'll get out of that horrible situation I'm in. One solution, not particularly an innovative solution. So what other solution might you imagine? Hitchhike. Sorry? Hitchhike. hitchhike. Leave the car there, you know, hope that it stays safely, uh, uh, you know, but uh, hitchhike. Any other? Doesn't Coke take rust off? Coke takes rust off. So if you have a Coke can, I'm told, uh, you can put Coke on the uh, thing. I often have often wondered whether I should drink Coke once I heard about, <laughs> once I heard about that solution, if it's eating rust, what's it doing to my insides? But let that be a separate topic of discussion. Coke, what else? 
Do I have a cigarette lighter? I could heat it up. You could try and heat it up, expand, see if I can do it. Excellent idea. Anything else? I could take a long pole and see if I can get more torque and turn it. Now, I could get engine oil out from the dipstick and take out some engine oil and see if I can, these are all interesting solutions. The folks who did a lot of work on what's called systematic inventive thinking that I'll share with you uh, in a minute, made, did, did the following solution. They took that jack out from under the car, we just placed there, Yamdi had lifted the car up, placed it under the cross wrench. Everyone following? Yeah. And of course, as you simply lift up the jack, because it's lifting up that handle, it'll turn the screw. Everyone following? Mm -hmm. So the jack can lift up a whole car, a measly screw, just by turning it. Everyone following? Now, I've done this talk many times, many students, many executive audiences, almost no one, and I would have no chance uh, to think of that solution myself, no chance. Why is it that we can't think of that solution? <clears throat> Why can't we think of using a jack? I told you there was a jack. I told you there was a cross wrench. All you have to do is put the jack and the cross wrench together and you solve the problem. But we will not think of that solution. Most audiences will not, I will not, most of us will not. And the interesting question is, why not? It's already being used. It, had, yeah, it could be the case, Judy, that it's already being used, but it could have been used. It's not yet started being used, but keep going. Keep going. Why will I not think about using a jack to turn a screw? It's not what it's supposed to do. Not what it's supposed to do. <laughs> not what it's supposed to do. A jack is used to lift a car. It's not supposed to lift a screw or turn a screw. My brain won't let me go there. We call that fixedness a kind of fixedness that is called functional fixedness. We assume that certain functions should, certain things are only to be done with certain functions. It's a bias that we have, a big bias that we have, that suggests that it limits the person to using an object only in the way it is traditionally used. If someone gave me a paper clip and said, Srikant, you know, this use, I'll have no problem. Very straightforward. But if my wires are a mess, and I said, can I use those clips to organize my wires? Shrikant, no chance. <laughs> no chance. It's not what it's supposed to be used for. My brain won't let me go there at all. Because it's not saying, you know, wow, clips are used to clip paper. What are you talking about organizing wires? You know, not even, your brain won't let you go there. And it's because of this particular bias. One of the things, this is why I said this creative thinking and innovative thinking is not that difficult or not that hard in some respects. Of course, there'll be very problem, problems that are much more complicated, is where we teach two principles. The one I'll just share with you is the closed world principle. The closed world principle simply says the only resources for inventing something new or solving a problem or dealing with any issue creatively are those that are already there. I'm not going to go find new things. Jack was there, wrench was there, Let's go about using both those in a different way without being functionally fixed. And you know, as we were discussing, Judy, earlier on, part of this functional fixedness that comes in many ways in education, we can talk about that, is how we teach, what we do. We have a functional, I'm, I'm supposed to do only a case, so I'm only going to do a case. I'm supposed to only give a lecture, I don't only give a lecture. It's a, it's a fixedness that comes, and what do you mean there's a different way or a better way to do it? No, I've always done it this way. It's the, what I'm used to and what I will do. So how do you break it? So I'm going to give you a couple very simple examples to think about how you would break it. What's going on in this particular product? Here you see a, a speed thing and on top of it is a solar panel, correct? What we're trying to communicate here is I'm already using the pole that already exists to fix a panel on top, right? I'm not going to create a new pole. I'm going to use existing resources. I already have a pole. I'm going to put a panel on top, of course, but I'm going to use, take advantage of the pole. What's happening with these ads that are there, you know, on this taxi and iPod and all that? <laughs> taxi is already there. It's an existing resource. I'm going to use, give it another task. Namely, let me use it for advertising. Right? It's not a very complicated idea. It's just say, take a resource that already exists, put another task to it. 
We call this technique of breaking fixedness, and the reason I'm going to do this is because I want to break fixedness. Otherwise, I'll only use resources in the way in which it is traditionally used, right? I have to break it. So I have to break it, I'm going to take any resource that exists, I'm going to assign it a new task. Now there's a lot of the early part of the course that I go through where I say once you've come up with a new task, you've got to make sure it's of value to the customer and all that. But first I want to just break my way of thinking. I don't want to be thinking in the same way in which I always think. So assign new tasks to an existing resource. Let me, and don't worry about the other parts for the purposes of our uh, this thing thing. Simply think of two things. Existing resource, because I'm in the closed world, new task. Those are the only two words I, a pair of words that I want you to think about. Existing resource, new task. Examples. So assign to a thermometer the task of also being a pacifier for a baby. <laughs> Already got a thermometer, it's an existing resource, might use it as a pacifier for a baby and I'll figure out what I might need to modify it a little bit. The existing resource, new task. Mobile banking for the unbanked. So no, no, bank doesn't have to be a big bank like you have? Can I store money on my phone so that poor people who don't have any banking uh, uh, opportunity can simply, phone already exists, assign it a new task, that of a bank, right? Existing resource, new task. Everyone following? That's what we're gonna keep practicing a couple of times. Eco power faucet. Water is already flowing through a faucet. And of course there's a turbine that you fit now underneath that water to charge that particular battery that is needed in order to, for that infrared signal to come when you put your hands under the, under the water to. Water is already flowing. Water is a resource. Flowing water is a resource. Fixedness tells me, yeah, that's fine, Shrikant, but that's to be wasted. Why should I waste it? There's energy in that water. Why can't I use it? Well, put a turbine, as the water is flowing, more you wash, powers it up again, for, for, you know, allows the, the, the sensor to be charged. Everyone following? I don't need to take electricity to do it. I've got, I've got a resource. Assign a task to it. <laughs> this is the best one. Customers who are waiting in line. It's a resource. They're all impatient trying to get onto a plane. They're all impatient trying to check out. It's a resource. Assign them a new task. What task? Check in yourself. Check out yourself. <laughs> Assign a new task. Task unification. Why should I think of customers as only being ones that I should use for that. Moving things to the cloud, we can think about. This is an interesting one. You remember this, uh, whenever your, uh, the computer thing comes, I don't know if you know that it's a brilliant example of task unification because when you type in those things, you're actually digitizing books. Because you, as you type in those particular words, they're typed in, it's called recapture. You're actually, it's task unification. Existing resource, us typing, assign it a new task, digitize, you know, books. Absolutely fantastic example of innovation because you can just use it to um, get onto things. I give this exercise, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it because I want you to do one other exercise that would be of value. I say, take the camera on your cell phone or your smartphone. Think of any existing application you like. Camera is a resource. I want to assign it a new task on any application that you like. How might you innovate if you are running any kind of business with trying to use that camera to assign it a new task. And my students would come up with this long list of fascinating things that you could do. So for instance, if you're traveling in a foreign country and you've got all these signs that are written in you know, Korean or Japanese, what if my camera could simply take a picture and I can automatically translate it so now I don't, I, I, when I'm traveling, I don't need to know all the language and symbols that are there, I just have it automatically. What if I'm going around and I see a landmark? I just take a picture and see the picture, it's connected to what tells me something about that landmark. You can imagine museums, other things, other places where you would do it. Some of my students, telemedicine, saying what if I could take a, if I have a rash in poor countries, I just take a snap, can go somewhere, someone can read it, just using the camera. Existing resource, it's not supposed to be used to diagnose rashes, but I'll assign it a new task, I can get it to do a new run. Weight control app, deaf and dumb application. Deaf and dumb is a very interesting one. If you imagine that I could use the camera for someone to just see how their lips are moving, and if from that the program could now tell you what they're saying, you can imagine how you could transform the lives of these people 
who are otherwise badly handicapped because they are deaf and dumb. Everyone following? Just taking an existing resource of only our limitation in not being able to take a resource and assign a new task. You are constantly thinking, take this room, how can I assign a new task? Take this uh, 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 computer, how do I assign? That's how you just keep thinking. Then you try and figure out what else you might do. If you had more time, I would give you this. This is an exercise just in the spirit of how we do the run the class just so that you have a feel for it. I would now at this point stop the class and say, okay, everyone understood fixedness, fu functional fixedness? Yes, everyone understand what's happening with respect to task unification as a way to break it in your small groups, break it. I won't put you in your groups, but let me see if you can just imagine. Can you think of something where, given what I've just said, you might be able to apply task unification, existing resource, apply it to a new task. Anyone can think of something where you have an existing resource. Let me give you a couple hints. All of us have cars, it's a resource. Could I apply it to a different task? Could I take everyone's car and give it a new task? Uber. Uber. Cooper is a five second application of this principle. Okay, everyone got a house? Everyone got a spare room in a house? <laughs> Take that spare room and give it a new task. Airbnb. Airbnb. Right? Five second application of these ideas. And I can go 15 others, once you practice it, you can go to 15 other ideas that would just come from there. Because all you're doing is breaking your fixedness. Why is it that we don't think of it immediately? Because I say, my car, what is the functional fixedness? It's only the function is what of my car? Only to transport my family, my friends, my children. That's it. So I break that, assign it a new task, say, well, what? Car resources are all over us. They're underutilized, not being utilized. But what if I apply a new task to it? I get Uber. My house, fixedness is, oh, my house is only for my family, my friends, my this, my that. Break that fixedness. It's functional fixedness. We have it in spades. I told you it's not so, but just assign another task. See if you can break it. If you can break it, you'll come up with a completely new idea. Everyone following? How? So one, everyone asked me, what's the value of this? I said, one is 18 billion, the other is 10 billion. Not a whole <laughs> lot, but not bad. Okay. Caitlin, why don't we give them the uh, horses just to show you one more fixedness before I close and start taking questions and show you how we actually try to break this other fixedness as well. I can take a few as well if you like just to move it to. So what you're getting is you're going to get two horses. Caitlin's just passing it out. Two horses, two riders. All right. And what you've got to do is rearrange the cards. That's it. So that both riders are riding on the horse's back. Can't have it riding under the belly. You know, nicely sitting on the horse's back and riding them. You can't bend, tear, cut the paper. You, you've, got your, you've got your jockeys there. You've got jockeys. So everyone should have two horses and two jockeys, and all you've got to do is put the jockeys on the horse's backs. Can't be underneath. No bending, tearing. No bending, tearing, nothing. You can collaborate. You can do whatever you want. Is this a Collaboration is always good in this course, Laura. Is this a room? <laughs> Everything visible. See, like this, this, and see how nicely he's sitting on top. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep it like that. Keep it like that. No, 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 no. This and sitting like that. The problem is our brains. See, this is a horse. No matter what you are telling your brain to do differently, it's going to keep making you try this. Oh, yeah. Because this looks enough like a horse that is going to do this. Right. But this is actually a horse and this is a horse. So we, I'll now tell you a technique to break this. Okay, everyone have it? Yeah. Here, I'll just show it to you on the thing. Put the two horses back to back like that. On the ground. On the ground. Yes. And that's it. It's as simple as that. Oh, jeez! <laughs> See, you won't even then see how you won't, your we brain is not so letting hard, you do this. Really oh my God! Solutions. Your brain is <laughs> not going to I let said, you do yeah. this. You, you had it. You had it almost, uh, uh, Jason earlier. That's amazing. So you just go like this, like this, and now you have to put it like that. <laughs> Everyone. 
Everyone following what, uh, what we just did? All right. And very quickly, why are we not able to do this when I'm just setting up the exercise? Why can't you do it this way? What's your brain telling you when I give you two horses, two riders? The rider has to be on one of the horse. You think of this, this thing as a horse, right? This first guy here, you say, this is the horse. You don't see when you put it like this, that that is actually a horse and that's also a horse. So many of you had it, horses don't run like this, they run like that. But your brain won't let you go there. And the reason the brain won't let you go there is because we have a certain fixedness that we call structural fixedness. So there's a second fixedness that I'll just share with you as to how you can break in a, in a minute and then we'll, so then you just put the things like that. Many, many of you had it like this, but your jockeys were still going under their bellies, right, in the other way. Because, because your brain is not letting you see that other horse. It just won't let you see it. You must have put it there. You must have tried it. You'll then do it. And it's, it's like only two angles that are possible, right? Once you put it like this, either it goes this way or it goes this way. And it's amazing how often your brain won't let you go to the other direction. Just fixedness that we have. Everyone following? It's not... And this is what I say. So here, just like we did task unification, we'll do through a couple of techniques which show you how you can do it. Let me explain it, the technique in the context of the rider problem because it's straightforward. If I had torn up these horses and given it to you, and now say solve this puzzle, you would have probably got it quite easily from what I, what I had given because then you wouldn't be seeing that horse. You would be thinking about how do you get a puzzle. We're going to argue that that very same technique you can now apply to changing a lot of the ways in which we ordinarily think and we call that technique, first let me say what the problem is. The problem is structural fixedness. I talked about functional fixedness, now structural fixedness. Structural fixedness is the tendency to think of an object or process as a whole with a defined structure that cannot be modified, divided, or rearranged. You were thinking of that horse as a whole, not cannot be modified, divided, or rearranged. So what are we going to do? We're going to break, so just like that car, really I want to go into that level of breaking down of a thing. Then I have an opportunity to rearrange things. If I don't break it, you can't rearrange because you're still going to be structurally fixed. So examples, division in the DVD industry. All we did was we said, okay, these controls, what if I could divide it and put it into two separate things? Now I say, is it handy for me to have a remote? Sure is, because I can just sit on my sofa and keep clicking and, you know, I don't have to feel like I have to go get up and do anything. But it's division. So the technique I'm going to talk about is division. By dividing a product, just like you if I'd torn up those horses, so think about that as the, as the uh, way in which you'd go, it, do about it, go about it. By dividing a product process or business model into its component parts, you see the collection in a new light. The process allows you to reconfigure things in unanticipated ways. And that's what we're going to now practice a couple of uh, examples on. And this one I'll really make you go through and then we can uh, take questions after that. So examples of division, zip car. The idea of zip car is simply that I'm going to divide the time. It's only our structural fixedness that says that I've got to rent a car for a day. No, I don't have to rent a car for a day. I can rent a car for 15 minutes, half an hour, one hour, two hours, no problem. Divide it. I'm just going to divide it, so I'll get zip car. Split air conditioners. I don't have to have the air conditioner and the compressor in one place. One can be outside. Divide it. No need to keep it. Everyone following? This is product division. I'll do a process one with you in a minute. Timeshare condos. That came, idea came simply from applying the concept of division. I don't have to own a house and then just be the only one owning it. I can own only one week of a house, correct? So once I divide it, lots of new opportunities show up in the way in which I can innovate. Control knobs you've already seen. Mortgage. This was a fa fa fantastic uh, innovation which just simply reversed the, changed the order of the process. Instead of getting a house first and then finding out if I'm qualifying for a mortgage, I get my mortgage first so I know how much I can buy and then I go look for a house. Just changing the process. Not necessarily thinking that I only get a mortgage after I've bought a house. Why not get a mortgage before I've gotten a house? So that's what we did. So now I'll just make you do one very quick exercise and if you can work on this fast in your groups, we'll have more time for questions. Last thing that I want to cover with you, one, one other small thing and then we'll be done. Imagining you're planning a trip, just to give you a flavor for the pedagogy of how division can be applied in uh, innovative ways. 
Imagine you're planning a trip for your family that will involve travel by plane. List 10 steps in that process from selecting a destination to boarding the plane. If you can just on, as a group, just write down, can be eight steps, nine steps, seven steps, somewhere near 10. For instance, you might say, let me go find out where I want to go. Then you might decide on your destination. Then you will go book a plane ticket. Quickly write down 10 steps. <laughs> So everyone has these uh, uh, 10 steps listed down, right? Now the issue is that because we have structural fixedness, we always think about these steps in the order in which you wrote it, right? And remember, what I'm trying to break here in these techniques is breaking structural fixedness. So here's a technique to break it. What I'm going to ask you to do is you're an airline executive tasked with creating a new offer for customers that wins them to your airline. You're trying to get now new customers to your airline. You can be an entrepreneur, you can be an executive, doesn't matter at this stage, just let's assume that. And I'm going to ask you to do a very simple thing because that's how we break fixedness. We're going to take a step that comes later in the process. Say it is the second to last stage in the process. And you're just going to move it earlier, say to the fourth place, arbitrarily. I don't know if it'll do anything for you, if it doesn't, try something else now. So everyone following what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to try and break fixedness in the way in which you do. Just take a step, any process. However, this teaching process, anything that you're doing, doesn't matter. Take a step that comes later, move it up. The thing that you want to do, of course, as you move it up is identify the benefits and create a new product around that change, one that gives your airline a competitive advantage. So as you move it up, you might find it doesn't really give you any real advantage. But then you might move something else up and say, oh my God, this suddenly opens up the market in a very different way than I had imagined in the way in which we're currently doing it. Now that's going to give you a competitive advantage. Everyone following? So I don't know which one it will work. I don't know if it's the second to last step. I don't know if it's the sixth that needs to go to third. That's if you have a lot of time, we get a chance to practice it more often. But take any step that comes later and disrupt it. Move it up into the process because I'm trying to get us to divide. I'm trying to get us to say, take all these steps and rearrange it. And the easiest way for me to explain that is through this exercise. There are more complicated ways in which we do it in class, but this will give you an easy way to do it. Everyone following? Go. All right, so let's, uh, so let's just take a couple of uh, quick uh, ideas. Willis, you guys had a couple two uh, ideas that you were talking about. Uh, we were talking about uh, perhaps with the idea of like the pre-approved mortgage, if you could arrange with the airline to have a visa um, procured for you in advance even before you've booked the flight. So uh, that could be a service they could offer. And then if you would arrive at the airport and they would have waiting for you a little packet of transformers and plugs, depending on the country <laughs> you're flying to, you wouldn't have to shop for it. Yeah. Chase, you folks had a couple as well. Okay, well, we, we were said packing is a bit of a pain. So, you know, if you're packing to go on a beach all day, to bring towels and all that sort of stuff, if you're going skiing, you need to bring all your ski gear. So, to offer a service whereby, in advance, if you're going to ski or on a sun holiday, that when you arrive at your destination, there'll be a pack of towels and all those sort of things there for you at your destination. If you're going skiing, you can send your shoe size and the, all those things in advance. So, when you arrive, all those things will be waiting for you. I, I was just saying, in, uh, just in the interest of time, one of my, one of my students has uh, moved the step of, uh, of uh, going to the airport before you know where you're going to go. So in other words, it's a lucky trip. And the idea was to open up the, the travel market to lots of people who can't afford to go. I mean, I'll want to go to a certain place only at a certain time because we can all afford to do it. But there are vast numbers of people who can't. Airlines are flying free seats, they don't want that. Hotels have free places, they don't want that. So can I give a budget, and then you can decide. It's a beach area, 
whichever airline has an opportunity at that time to send, you might only have three days notice or four days notice to actually do it, might that be an opportunity. So it's actually, it's called luckytrip.com if someone wants to go look at the mm -hmm. website, but it's based on the simple principle of breaking fixedness and trying to do it upfront. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let me just summarize and then take uh, questions, see how you might apply it. You know, it's an, the, these kinds of thinking techniques say that we have to also, you know, break our fixedness in how we think. So when we are designing buildings, for instance, we always say, let me first figure out the function and then I'll figure out what the form is. Because our brains are fixed in the way in which we are fixed, what we did actually was exactly the opposite. I first asked you to manipulate your brain in some way task, apply a new task, divide up the process and change it. I don't know if it will do anything for you, but I asked you to change the form first. Because you changed the form, I manipulated it, created a virtual product. I have no idea if it will have any value. Then you will look at the benefits, advantages, marketing filter, feasibility filter, and then come up with the idea. So that's how we believe that we might have some hope of changing fixedness in our brains, because if I just asked you to think of that idea, it won't come to you won't come to me for sure, I know. It might come to you, but it won't come to me. I'm very badly fixed, so I've got to use these props to kind of change the way in which I've got to think before I can come up with a new idea. I won't go through this prototyping thing. This is a very important segment of the course that has to do with risk reduction, that anything that you are thinking about can be prototyped. And we might get into that in the question session, uh, Willis, because the mantra that we use is fail early, fail often to succeed sooner. Try lots of experiments. And you try a lot of experiments, you'll get an idea about what you can uh, do and cannot do. For instance, if you are prototyping a new restaurant, Bertucci's Two Ovens, those of you who might have seen it, it's a new concept that they are coming up. They were trying to figure out how, can, how should they lay out their new style of restaurant that they're just about to introduce. And one of the things they did was made the entire restaurant out of foam core or thermocol. That everything you see there is that. They were able to move, it cost hardly anything. People were able to move around. What did they discover? They found that their patrons like to see the pizza being cooked. Wherever you're sitting in that restaurant, you will be able to see the pizza being made. And that turns out to be a very positive thing for it. But how did they do it? They first just prototyped it, figured out whether it has anything. Not high expense. You can't design the whole restaurant, then find out that's what your patron wants. You have no time to do it. So that's a problem. OK. Last thing I want you to do in literally two minutes. It shouldn't take you. Please just follow these instructions carefully, and, 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 and uh, I'll close at that point. We go through a lot of these things in the course on how do you manage innovation. Obviously, I haven't spent much time on this, but this is a useful way for me to kind of summarize it. I want you to think about your preference for assertiveness, your own preference for assertiveness. Are you a person that likes to explore, or are you a person that is decisive? Are you a person that likes to evaluate risks, or are you a person that likes to take risks? Are you a person that is flexible and patient, or are you bold and fast-paced? Do you like to engage others, or do you express opinions? Are you speculative, or are you directive? Everyone following? If you're more of this type in your work environment, I, some people tell me I'm one like this at work and then I'm a different person. <laughs> at home, I only want to know in your work environment, not want to get too personal here. So if you're more ask on your sheet of paper, each one do it individually, on your sheet of paper, write, are you ask or are you state? Usually I get people to move around in the class and do other things, we can talk about that later. But just write down on a sheet of paper, are you an ask type person or a state type person? Got it? Okay. Now I want to know what's your preference for thinking. Are you a divergent type person or a convergent type person? What's a divergent person? Prefers generating options. Convergent, prefers evaluating and selecting options. Divergent, prefers experimenting. Convergent, prefers decision making. Divergent, favors unusual ideas. Convergent, favors critical thinking. Divergent, enjoys exploration and synthesis. Convergent, enjoys analysis. So on a sheet of, on your same sheet of paper, you, where you've written whether you are ask or state, write down if you are diverge or converge. So you would have written two things on your sheets of paper, either ask or state, diverge or converge. Everyone have that? Okay. So now that forms a little bit of a matrix for me, two by two. I can either you are, and I'm going to ask you to put up your hands depending on which one you are. Ask diverge. How many of you are, you believe you are ask diverge? One, two, three, four, five, six, okay. 
How many of you are ask converge? Okay, about somewhat similar, okay. How many of you are diverge state? <laughs> Two, very good, very good. And how many of you are converge state? Three, okay. So we've got actually the room has many different things. Usually I ask people to get up, uh, move around. I ask now the following question in my class. Who do you think is most, if you're trying to form a team, because innovation will not only occur individually, it'll occur in groups, in teams. If you're trying to form a team, who do you think is the most critical person in forming a team in order to get innovative thinking to occur? Which of these folks do you say, if I want innovation, I want to find people who are like this, would you say one, two, three, four, which of those particular quad quadrants? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Who, who would you want in your team? Yeah. Ask Diverge. And why would you say ask Diverge? And um, I would think that they would be more open and curious and creative. More open, curious, creative, right? Anyone disagree with that? Anyone think that others are important as well? Converge is also important. Which one is important? Converge. Converge is also important. Why is converge important when you're thinking? The team, uh, not only just in case others, yeah, some ideas, but uh, uh, at the end you should make decision. Yeah. Everyone following? Everyone, you're, you're saying, everyone needs to make a decision. If you've got too many people who are asked diverge, <laughs> nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. <laughs> Lots of good discussion, <laughs> but nothing ever happens. And so what I conclude in my class is that actually all those four are crucial, not just interesting, crucial in the innovation process. If you're trying to form an innovative organization, innovative team, innovative university, innovative school, doesn't matter, you need all four types. Because the first group, that is the clarifiers, help in that early stage of the innovation process. They're asking lots of questions, they're diverging, they're problem framing, they're likely to start thinking about these other circles, they're likely to ask how might we, they're likely to reframe problems. That's, that's what they're very good at. The next group, the ideators, belong in this bucket, diverge and state. They're still divergent, but boom, 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 boom. They can state, give you one idea after the other. They're very crucial in terms of the ideation that is going to come up, very crucial. Then ask and converge, but at the moment I'm, you know, I've got these clarifiers, I've got these ideas guys, we're going all over beautiful uh, territory, you know, <laughs> where we've got all manner of fantastic ideas. Somebody has, you said, has to bring them together. So the developers, you know that prototyping thing, the running experiment saying, okay, you got an idea, you got an idea, let's figure out which idea is better and figure out how we want to go. How do we prototype? That's all convergent and we, we, we uh, convergent, but ask. They are asking, you know, let's get run this experiment. And then you need the implementers. You need people who at the end of the day will get things done. And if you don't have that, you won't be able to do it. What's the challenge in managing innovation, which is the last part of our course? is for instance, the clarifiers and the implementers can't stand each other. <laughs> the clarifiers are saying, let's get it more clarified. If you haven't yet got the problem, what's not clear to you, my friend? <laughs> We've got to get things done. You can't keep clarifying, keep, uh, keep, you know, you've got to get things, something happening. You can't just keep doing this. And of course, the whole process of managing innovation, which is the last part of our course, goes into how do you kind of now form these teams, there's lots of good, research that we try and access to see how we, in the design thinking and innovative and creative problem solving process in teams, how do you get all these things to work together? You need the diversity, but then you need to manage it very well. That's as far as I would want to go. Uh, 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 thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions. Well, thank you. So in our remaining half hour, let me frame this in two ways that you may be able to connect what you've done today to, to your own work. One way is to think about it um, as much from a content perspective. I mean, how would you create an environment in which innovation might occur more within your field? So whether it's innovative legal thinking or innovation in science, even innovation in how one might analyze uh, literature or 
uh, or history. I think the second way of thinking, and these are not mutually exclusive, is how do we think about innovating in general around pedagogy? And some of the exercises we did about breaking down traditional ways of thinking about teaching. Um, and, and so I'd be curious to get some, either your own connections as you were thinking perhaps about your own fields uh, of, of study and teaching, uh, or if there were particular questions uh, to elaborate on some of the concepts to, uh, to offer those as well up for uh, Srikanth. So I'd like to, yeah, Terry? Yeah, I, I was uh, eager to hear more about the field method as an <coughs> instance of that sort of creative thinking. Mm -hmm. So applying it to yourself? Yeah, yeah, no, so uh, field method is clearly part of that is, I don't know if everybody knows what the field method is that we're doing at the business school, as we talked about in Rethinking the MBA, it's a doing skill, so rather than only studying cases, our students will go out, look at a real problem, try to go through some of the creative thinking process. Uh, it's got three parts, so the first part has got to do with you know, thinking a large part about yourself, your own impact that you have on people, so leadership. Second part, they go out into different parts of the world, so these are projects that we run uh, in many different countries, all 900 students except for a small group that can't travel and are doing projects in the US are going to all different countries. They have a real project in a real company, unstructured, much like we were talking about, and now trying to identify techniques. So they'll be taught a few of the techniques and then they'll be going out to try and apply what it is that they've got. The third is actually a completely into design thinking in, as, as a whole course because the third part of the, the course is one where they have to come up with an idea. We give them a little bit of money. Many of them will de design web applications for instance. Uh, we give them some amount of resources and then they actually come up with an idea and the next section will actually evaluate how good those particular ideas are so that uh, you know, you almost create a venture capital kind of a market for these students. So very much along the lines of what we were just talking about, uh, uh, Terry. So something that we are trying, we are continuing to adapt it, improve it. It's not something that we've done for a long time, only three, four years at this point. But uh, I mean, very much in the spirit of, of being in the gap and trying to figure out how you would uh, actually be comfortable uh, living there. Yeah, I'd like to, I'm from a science background, and we tend to think very linearly. And you, uh, you have talked about the importance of breaking this down. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to give you an example, I once saw a magic show by a man by the name of Ricky Jay, who's one of the world's great magicians. And I, I was amazed, I just couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. and I went in and I saw him the next day at a clothing store, and I said, Mr. Jay, that's fantastic, and of course, any doctor always makes sure that everybody knows that he's a doctor. So I said, I'm a doctor professor. He said, that's very interesting. You're the easiest people to fool. <laughs> <laughs> because you think in a very linear way, just like Three Card Monty in yeah, yeah. Central Park. Yeah. You're thinking linearly, and of course, they're doing something else. And the most difficult people he told me to fool are children. Yeah. Because they, so how do you, how do you break down this, this sort of linear thinking and make us think more like, more like a child? Like a child, yeah. No, I'm, Is I'm, that a fair question? It's a very, very, very fair question. And uh, a lot of research has been done in the field of design thinking and innovation where, uh, you know, we have something called the marshmallow problem. And if we had more time on a, in a course like, in my course, I, when we do prototyping, we'll cover that or it'll be done in the field course, as Terry, you were asking. It's a very simple thing. It's like you uh, take a number of marshmallow, uh, you take a number of uh, spaghetti sticks, and you build as tall a tower as you can with the condition that the marshmallow is on top. Right? Very simple exercise, not very complicated. Everyone can understand it and you do it. And the people who build the tallest stars are, of course, the kids. And people like us, for all the reasons, that's why I said, I'm exhibit A of being fixed because, you know, we are taught to think, you know, you get rewarded for thinking very linearly and, uh, you know, uh, in your field and moving your field as it progresses and making your uh, contributions, research contributions to it. So we tend to not be able to uh, break that kind of uh, thinking and my hope is that 
And so, and as children, we all had it, to your point. And as we keep getting more and more, as he said, Dr. Professor, as we keep getting more and more educated, you know, it's, it is called expertise. So, you, you know, you're an expert. And to be an expert, you have to kind of follow that particular process, make sure everyone else understands what you're doing. And then your contribution is that next linear step that you took that nobody else could take. But if you're trying to completely break the paradigm, which we've got to do in many, many fields, uh, we've got to break that way of fixedness and think more like a child. And my hope is that, uh, I mean, there's lots of things that eventually in organizations or in academia would help. Cultures matter, you know, how we kind of think about these, uh, the risks that we take matter. So there are a whole bunch of uh, what I might call cultural social factors that are obviously very, very important. As kids, we don't really care about that as much. You're, you're happy to make a mistake. You don't really care. Here, your, 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 you know, trep is great trepidation if I make an error, right? I mean, that's like, oh my God, how could you, have, how could you have done that? That f freedom to fail, that freedom to question, that, and, and and we are supposed to be doing that in a big way at our universities, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. But I think the the entire structure. Uh, you know, prevents that from that from happening, and uh, my hope is that at least if we got these techniques down, you begin to start questioning it, trying things out, and you know, at least on the technical side, you're making progress. Because otherwise, how do I do it? You know, you say, okay, break it, break it, break it, but how? And so many of these design thinking approaches and innovative thinking, creative problem solving approaches, another you know, beautiful exercise that we run on creative problem solving. It literally can take you through the steps and say, okay, if I wanted to solve a problem more creatively than what we've done, how might we do it? And they all have to do with, uh, uh, you know, as I say, breaking these fixednesses that you were just alluding to. So give them the techniques, but I think your point is very important because there's a lot of other things also that has to happen simultaneously you know how do you change the social contract how do you change the culture how do you change the values how do you how is it okay for us to fail and you know we kind of say of course we have tenure because that's what it's supposed to provide us but you know reputations matter things matter you're much more guarded in in terms of doing it there's a so and and you know it's a very un, if you think about how the brain actually functions in this area it's very interesting that um, uh, the two parts that uh, that are seen among these design thinking folks who are not no neurological experts, so those of who those those of our colleagues who are that probably have a much better insight to it than I would have from reading this literature, but the prefrontal uh, cortex, where the much of the individual p processing occurs, is where there's limited capacity. You know, we we are very limited in that capacity. Only when something goes into the basal ganglia can we, it becomes a matter of habit. Other than that, you have to keep, uh, you have to keep, you know, going at it. And so what my hope is that is if we can teach these techniques and break it, you know, systematically, it's going at the back. It's becoming a matter of habit that I will question. And I can tell you actually in my own case, as I say, I'm as badly fixed as anyone. I wouldn't have gotten any of those exercises if I hadn't known what they were. I wouldn't, no chance about the ropes, no chance for the, uh, for the flat tire, no chance for the horses. Because, you know, you kind of over, over a period of time develop this so-called expertise. And, you, it, and that's deeply in my head. And any time I have to break it, I, you know, it's, it's hard. I, I won't be able to do it. So the hope is that can we create these techniques that it becomes more a matter of habit. And if we can do that, then there's some hope at least of breaking it. Still, the culture will have to be changed. And that's a, that's a tough question that you asked. And don't know how we would do that. So one of the questions is, how, do you, how would you combine for undergraduates or graduate students teaching the expertise, I mean, having them really learn that, and be unfixed at the same time? So, uh, you know, the, the, the principle I have tried to follow in the course, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, as more students go out, I'm going to try and, of course, follow their careers, see whether it had any, you know, I'm going to kind of still, I'm still fixed in my old ways of uh, thinking about the scientific method. So I'll, you know, try and follow some of those things uh, at a later point in time. But uh, I, I don't think that it is, if you know the techniques and they become, as I said, that's why I call them techniques. If you know the techniques and they become more like techniques, I'm trying to kind of sneak in, you know, what people like to do uh, 
and yet use it in a very different way. So I wouldn't know how you would innovate if I gave you the, the, uh, uh, the travel problem. I just don't know. You know. A very, very creative person might come up with a very different solution than a less creative person might. But at least you would begin to question that. And any time you're looking at anything, you begin to see an opportunity for innovation where you didn't see. I still think you, so it's, it's basically your question framed differently is, I got to keep moving the left hand here, right? I mean, that's the knowledge part. Yeah, and, and then on the other side, I've got to start being comfortable living in the gap. And how do I kind of help people do it? So it's the book knowledge and then this so-called expansive knowledge, you know, that we are trying to get, which is knowledge that's not in any book as such. You're trying to create it. How do you do both? I think it's possible. I think at least my own experience, limited experience has been that I have seen and I've had many opportunities to actually try these techniques in many situations in my life. And every time I'm, I'm doing that, I can see it becoming more a matter of uh, habit. And I think it can come. So how do you assess you know, the success of your students in becoming creative, unfixed? So there are, there are uh, uh, so what happens in, at the business school is after the course, I run a course with the iLab called uh, um, an, an iLab project course, if you will. I forget, we have a more fancy title, but it's basically a project course with the iLab. Uh, last year, and I would imagine this is going to happen again each year, uh, one third of my students will take that follow-on course because I tell them that you know, more of this has to do with practice, right? At the end of the day, how much practice do you get in terms of doing this? Because I've taught you sort of the strokes, but how do you, how do you keep practicing it so that you get better at actually executing on, on those kinds of ideas? And when I look at what the students have done in that uh, period, it's actually been quite amazing. Uh, very, very, they applying all these techniques. Many of them, of course, are doing it to their own entrepreneurial ventures. So I already have a bias sample in that sense. They're already keen on doing something. But then they'll come, and the way I run that course is I just get them to, every two weeks, Caitlin will organize something. We'll sit down together. We'll each give these people feedback in terms of developing the ideas. I can see where their idea was at the beginning and where it is at the end, and how much they have applied design thinking to what it is that they're doing. These days, you know, many of them want to do that, so that's fantastic, and we have a lot of things. I have also, uh, I source projects from companies, uh, people who are interested in doing it, many social, for instance, uh, one of the big projects we're doing just now is with, at Mass General Hospital, where they are redesigning healthcare uh, because of uh, the Affordable Care Act and you know, implications that that has. And we are doing, every single department is going through this thing, and every one of them, we're pushing them to think, why do you have this process in this way? What if I change this step in this way? What would happen if I assigned this task to something else? And it's actually amazing how many opportunities there are. I mean, we were, I'll give you one very uh, simple example. One of the problems that arises is, and, and as you can see, it's a very tricky problem. Uh, people will call an ambulance and want to go to the hospital. And the challenge is, that of course there are certain people who should be moved to the ambulance from the from you know to the hospital from the ambulance there are others who should not be but the way the process is designed once the ambulance goes there they have no ability to make any kind of choices and so what we're trying to work at at mass general is what if we change that step in the process move the decision part of the process a little earlier see can we change it can we get some expertise on it before so that we're not unnecessarily incurring a whole ton of costs and it turns out to be a quite a big number uh, as a result of that people who need to be discharged the where they have to be discharged are the problem so what if i move that step in the process earlier could that reduce the time that people are just staying in the hospital currently because you know, we haven't yet figured out. So many opportunities just by applying design thinking principles to that problem. So I'll get these problems in, get our students to practice working on it, test it at Mass General to see if in fact it's helping them do it. They can't get enough of our students. So it has they, to work in, in reality. In reality. There, there's not a simple valuing of novel. I, I think you there is, we call it, uh, design heuristic, so there's another little segment that we do where you can, but you know, for me, the home run is if it works in real life, that's like the, the perfect solution. 
but uh, and, and I'm absolute, we, they can't, I mean, every time, and in fact, uh, the person who's running it comes to my class, he says, Srikanth, I need these guys, so I'm going to come to your class and make a pitch, and he does, and, and you know, we try and give them as many students as we can, and uh, it's been a fantastically good collaboration. Uh, uh, my business is teaching children, and the, the idea of the magician and the child yeah. is just fascinating yeah. to me, yeah. because what we're doing in schools right now is we're weaning that out. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and yeah. yet we think, when I started teaching in the 1970s, yeah. I built with straws and marshmallows. Correct. And I actually had my children build out of paper yeah. chairs they could sit on. And they did it themselves in third grade. Super. In third grade, yeah. Super. But we're weaning them yeah. from that. And yet now you're having to pick it up yeah. and start all over again. Yeah. So <laughs> if we could take oh, it No, 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 it's absolutely, I mean, so both those questions. You were, if you were to convince those people who are making teachers eliminate, yeah. these ideas are gone, they don't do them anymore. Yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing? And yeah. it's so much more sensible yeah. to start then yeah. and imagine what you're going to do when they became graduate students. Yeah. But then there always is that question of how do you learn and be unfixed at the same time? Yeah. And what is learning? Yeah. And I'm just throwing it out. No, 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 no. And, and, that, yeah, and, and, and there's a very nice uh, presentation that uh, uh, Google does in how they apply design thinking to Google Glass. If you just go Google Glass and go onto the web, you'll see it. It's a beautiful eight-minute presentation, beautifully done. But that's what they say. They say the, they have a little circle here, and they say this is kind of existing knowledge because Google is always trying to, you know, drive a less car. I mean, you'd say, geez, that's not possible. You know, I mean, come on, that's breaking fixedness of a major kind. You say car, next word that comes to you is driver, right? I mean, you won't even think that you can break we call that attribute dependency. You won't actually be able to break it, but of course you can. And Google Glass, they were showing how they prototyped it. They have this thing called book knowledge, and here they call it expansive knowledge. And they say this is the frontier that you're trying to cross. And of course, it's very important to have that knowledge. So, you know, when you're talking about science and the thing, you must, have, you can't ignore your body of knowledge. So we can't not do that. But I don't think it's an either or, at least my own, my own, uh, uh, let me say, journey into design thinking. Because I'm, as I say, I come from a totally different background. I'm as fixed as you can get, you know, in terms of uh, what you do. In fact, you know, when you're talking about some of the things in accounting and finance, you don't want to be particularly creative, you know. You, uh, <laughs> you, want, to be, you want to be, you know, fixed in, uh, in important ways. But uh, I think it's entirely possible to train your brain to be doing both. It's not, it's got a lot more power, but it has to move from the part where, you're, where the processing gets to be very heavy and difficult to a part where it's much more natural. So I think, and, and that's what happened in the early years that you were describing. So when I'm constantly doing the kind of exercises you're making them do, it's going into that part of the brain where it's much more natural, much more uh, thing. And I mean, I think, you know, it was precisely because we did that, that uh, certainly in the United States, we've had so much of, and that's, a, that's from my point of view, a real problem. It's a really, really, really big problem because we're trying to now, you know, figure it out at this stage much later when we needn't have lost it at the early stage. So I think I just want to maybe hear a little bit more about the accounting. But I, I teach survey research and I, I have the students design surveys and work on projects. And sometimes the problem I have is they innovate so much that they're no longer doing a survey. <laughs> what are they doing, Chase? I'm very, it's a fascinating point. Fascinating. What do they do, Chase, when you say they're innovating so much it's not a survey? What do they do when you say that? Well, they'll, they'll, they, did, they will ignore the idea of taking a scientific sample or a random <laughs> sample. Or, or, or in other cases that might be really prescient, but they will try to not actually administer a questionnaire to get responses from people, which might even be something I wish some of my colleagues would do, but but if I'm trying to teach them how to administer a questionnaire, which is part of the body of the course, mm -hmm. then then I can't have them doing observational research mm -hmm. or doing something differently. Mm -hmm. So so in effect, if I don't bring people in and tell them about the beauty of drawing a random sample, mm -hmm. they will assume that they can take any old bunch of people mm -hmm. and study them and draw an inference. Mm -hmm. and, and there might, actually might be lots of sophisticated ways of doing that, yeah. but that's not what I'm teaching. Yeah, yeah. If that 
No, yes. no, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, a very, very important question and it does come to uh, the issue about uh, are there domains and areas where, uh, you know, being more restrictive is a good thing rather than always a bad thing? And I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, my, my, my classic example of that would be if I'm running a nuclear power plant, don't want too much innovation of changing the knob here and there and <laughs> seeing, you know, what might happen to the power that I generate. You know, I might, uh, I, want to, I want you to please follow the physics and the rules and the laws that apply and just be within those confines at that point because, you know, the risks of uh, doing something crazy are too high. So, it's a balance, I think, that the, the point that you're making and it's an important balance uh, uh, that there are, there is a certain in other words, a certain discipline that you have to kind of follow in certain uh, respects and uh, one must respect that in, in, in important ways in certain parts of what we do. The challenge, and then it comes back again to that question, is that of course that's fine for that part, but then now there might be other things where you don't want to apply it. The way I teach it in the course, if I was to try and connect this to what we do, is I draw two circles. I call one the operation cycle and the other the innovation cycle. And I say that in the operation cycle, you run with rules, standards, uh, processes. And in the innovation cycle, you know, it's exactly the opposite. You're trying to come up with new ways of doing things, uh, 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 you know, creating new methods and new processes. And of course, once you've perfected them through prototyping, they'll come back into the operation cycle. If you run your innovation, that's to your point, if you run your innovation cycle with these principles, disaster. If you run your operation cycle, which is your point with these principles that we are used for innovation, disaster. So you have to be in that sense ambidextrous in terms of trying to see what it is. And I think that's true for all of us. It's just that uh, we tend to focus we have the opposite problem much along the lines you're saying is where we're so comfortable on no change, keep do what we're doing the same way, not thinking, that then of course it becomes a challenge in how much of the other one we can do. But you have to be respectful of that operation cycle is in, in your, in your uh, if I was to translate that, you have to be respectful, you have to follow those things. And yet there might be opportunities here to innovate and might get into the operation cycle later. Someone might have done random, but you might say, okay, now might I do stratified sampling? Might that have better properties? You know, I mean, you, we can see how sampling might have kind of gone in that direction with some innovation, but then you don't want to kind of say, forget about any kind of sampling, because you might not get good inferences. Time maybe for one more observation or question? Well, I, I, I sort of follows up from several of the, of the comments, both from Chase and from Lee, which is that, um, and it's something that actually worries me a little bit, the, and the reason why I raise sort of novelty is the pendulum swinging in another direction, which is it has to be maximally novel and maximally disengaged from expertise and history. Mm -hmm. And that one must always begin from ground level, mm -hmm. as if you know nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's enormous value in that mm -hmm. as an exercise, mm -hmm. but I've seen students do things. It's, it, you know, it's, it's exactly the point we made. And then they come up with things, or you know, that shape, we're just simply, that's just not right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, that it just doesn't work, yeah. right? And yeah. it will not work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, even in the, it's something that I, I find very interesting now. So I, I, for whatever reason, I'm involved a lot with startups that are trying to disrupt the publishing industry, yeah. which is a favorite target yes. of disruption, especially, yes. especially you know, in terms of academic publishing textbooks, etc. And the way in which I see so many startups just completely ignore the value of copying, right. um, etc., etc., etc. And you start to think, well, great. Yeah. But, you know, then what happens at the end? Yeah. What comes out? Yeah. But there's this very almost religious view of, don't show me that. Yeah. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to be fixed yeah, by that. By anything. Yeah. So how how do you fixed by that? How do you fixed by that? Exactly. So yeah. how do you strike the golden <coughs> box balance? Yeah. So it's not a too very hard, not too hard. it's a beautiful question. So <laughs> it is really a beautiful question. Um, 
you know, it was very interesting. When I first started this uh, uh, journey into thinking about uh, what I would do in my design thinking course, I had exactly that challenge or problem. So there's one aspect of design thinking that goes into this uh, loosely speaking called brainstorming and then you kind of do all sorts. I didn't do any exercises on that with you, but of course we cover those exercises. There are, there are clearly reasons to do that and benefits to doing that. Then there's this other stream of you know, ideations all in that, what are techniques of ideation that actually takes the view that you took, you know, which is a little bit of what I kind of did in the session that I did with you. I didn't kind of go for some you know, I said, take existing resources, reconfigure. I said, take an existing process, redo it. So, and I can, we can go through many other techniques of that type. That tries to say, let's not go in this amazing direction here, but let's innovate in the small. And I, I tell my students, I have a lot of respect for people who innovate in the small. I am not necessarily expecting everyone to be doing this amazing, amazing kind of uh, innovation. You know, they'll try a little, uh, 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 you know, little experiments and they'll learn and they'll eventually become very good at innovating. You know, the analogy would be to, uh, you know, people like uh, Picasso and Cezanne. If you look at Picasso and Cezanne and look at their works over a period of time, it's a totally different pattern. And Picasso, clear genius. He could change all the rules of painting at age 26 or 28 or whatever and, you know, phenomenal, no question. Cezanne, totally different, you know, slowly, 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 by the time you look at Cezanne's work in, in his later years of his life, it's through this very detail, respecting it, yet changing, respecting, changing, you know. I think both are valid, you know, whether you're going to, so some people think they're going to be Picasso, so that's what they are trying to do on this side. It's a problem if you're not a Picasso and think you're a Picasso and you're, very few of them, very few of them, that's exactly the point. And then otherwise you follow the other route, which is the much more experiment, learn, experiment, learn, experiment. And I'm very respectful of that. I teach both and I tell them to be respectful of both. I don't know which one they will find more valuable when they actually come up to a particular problem. Should you respect, not respect? How much do you respect? How much do you change? And keeping that balance, but that idea that you've got to be ambidextrous, moving on both sides is a very crucial idea that I try to encourage. So can you teach your accounting courses I have actually not gone back to teaching it, but I'm certain that I would if I were to go back. I'm certain that I would. I mean, I can tell you later if you, I mean, any number of instances where I've seen the opportunity to apply these techniques. And uh, it just changes it. And the more you practice it, it's a little bit like swimming. It's more a little bit like driving. First time you're starting to drive, you have to think, you know, exactly what do I press? Where's the club? Or, once now, most of us, we don't even think about it when you're, because it's gone from that front part of the brain into the thing. It becomes much more, but you've got to practice it, practice it, practice it, practice it. And that's why doing it early and continually, continually, you lose it if you don't practice it is crucial. That's why that analogy of the dog jumping into the pool. And by the way, the same issue that we were talking about, you know, one of my challenges right now is, and we're of course going to try and solve the problem, is our school is structured to be a case method school. That's what Harvard Business School worldwide is known for that. And I'm just saying, as I did in the seminar, that you know, for me, case method would not work at all. I cannot teach this class in Aldrich. Not possible. Because it's not a discussion class. It's like you've got to do stuff. You've got to figure it out. You've got to make stuff. You've got to... So now we're now trying to figure out how do we, on our campus, get these spaces that we can do it. Now, iLab turns out to be a fantastic resource for us. Luckily, happens to be on our campus, so I get to get the benefit of just you know hopping out of my office and being able to go there. But it's the same thing, you know. You don't want to complete. But is it a fantastic method for many many things? Of course it is. Is it a fantastic method for everything? Not in my view. Well, thank you so much, Srikant. Very welcome.